Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together to listen to your word today. We know that this is revelation from Christ, the head of the church, to the church members of his body, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We're asking, Lord, today that your spirit will take these words and print them upon our hearts in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that as you enrich us with your word, we are praying, O oh Lord, it will reflect in our lives in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that it will mold us. It will direct us and guide us in the right direction in Jesus' name. That the same spirit that inspired your word, that same spirit will illuminate the word and instruct us in your word and quicken us to walk in the way of the Lord in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, as a result of hearing your word, we we'll become better Christians and better members of the body of Christ and better ministers in the vineyard of the Lord in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord, and help us to really concentrate as the word will be coming forth to every heart. Bless us in the study of your word. Make us a channel of blessings to all the people. In Jesus' name we pray. We come in our study of the word of God today to Revelation chapter 2. The Lord has been taking us through a study of the word. And a study of the word has been very beneficial to every one of us. We have studied chapter 1, we have seen the glorified Christ. I need to remind you once again that this book of Revelation is divided into three parts. Part 1 is the things that you see. Part 2, the things that are. Part 3, the things that shall be. Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen. That is the picture and, and the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the things which are. That is the church. The things happening in the church. All through the age of the church. And then number 3, the things which shall be hereafter. After the church is raptured, then there will be a lot of things happening over here on earth. The great revelation. And there will be some things happening in the courts of heaven. Before the throne of God. The worship of the Lord Almighty and the worship of the Lamb. By the saints of God, the redeemed people of God. We are now in this second part of the revelation. That is the things which are. And as he talks about the things which are, he's talking about the church. He already given uh, John that he was indicating that he was going to write to the church. And he was using John as a penman that will take the message of Christ, the head of the church, and take it to the whole church, the seven churches in Asia. As we are reading then about the churches in Asia Minor. That is the church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pagamos, the church in Tatira, the church in Sardis, and the church in Philadelphia, and the church in Laodicea. You understand how those churches were planted? The Lord used Paul the Apostle. After Paul the Apostle, there were different pastors and evangelists and teachers of the word that helped in making those churches grow. Now Christ had gone to heaven. And many years had actually passed. And the church was now undergoing persecution. And uh, one of the great leaders of the church, in fact, the last surviving apostle, John, the beloved, he was going through persecution. As a result of the persecution, he was banished to the Isle of the Patmos. And now where he was in the Isle of Patmos, the Lord revealed himself to him. And he was giving him this revelation that you'll give to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now we come to the church in Pagamos today. I now read from Revelation chapter 2. From verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, This thing, says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and that thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against thee with the sword 
of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcometh. What I give to it of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. That's the message of Christ we're going to look at today. Uh, you, you must remember that when the Lord wrote to the church, he wrote to the leader of the church. Do you realize that all that Jesus said, he confronted the pastor of the church. And every question he had, every commendation he had, every condemnation he had, every correction he had, he directed to the leader, to the pastor of that church, to the angel of the church of such and such a place, right? That means then, uh, the pastor, the leader in the church cannot say, well, it's not my fault. I've done my best. I've done the preaching. And the people are just doing whatever they want. No, you're still responsible. Because it is to the angel of each church that the Lord wrote. Have you noticed uh, the name angel? Look at it in verse 12 again. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos, right. He referred to them as the angel. Why did he refer to the leader of that church as angel? Uh, look at Psalm 103 and verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. What do you find here about angels? And you are to be an angel if you are a leader. Angel in this sense, number one, excel in strength. Number two, you do his commandments. Number three, you are listening, you are hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. We're told in Luke chapter 1 verse 5 there was in the days of herod the king of judea a certain priest named zechariah of the cause of abiah and his wife was of the daughter of aaron and her name was elizabeth in verse 6 it says and they both they were both righteous before god walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the lord blameless that's angelic that's a characteristic the Lord is expecting that if you are a leader among the people of God, there's something that characterizes your life, excel in strength, do his commandments, and hack into the voice of his word. In John chapter 14, verse 21, He that has my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself, unto him it tells us in first timothy chapter 6 verses 13 and 14 i give the charge in the sight of god who quickness all things and before christ jesus who before pontius pilate witnessed a good confession timothy what's timothy to do that thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable until the appearing of our lord jesus christ you see then what the lord is telling us that if you're a leader in the church the lord is referring to you as the angel of that church and as the leader of that church we are to excel in strength have to do his commandments and then you are to make sure that you're hearkening to his word in fact it's on that basis that you'll be able to get to heaven revelation chapter 22 I'm reading to you there from verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. But as you come to this church, that is the church in the city of Pagamos, it looks like this angel did not measure up. He had not done everything he ought to do. And as the Lord was talking to this church, he confronts the angel of the church, the leader of that church, because of the corrupting influence of compromise in that church. You know, these epistles written to seven churches in Asia Minor. They were written to those churches mentioned there. But the message of Christ in them transcends those churches. And they are applicable to us today. When I read the epistle to the Ephesians, I don't say, well, that's just for the church of Ephesus. It's applicable today. When we're reading the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Philippians, we don't say that's for Philippi. Yes, it's applicable today. The same thing. All these epistles, all these messages that were given to those churches in Asia Minor, was applicable to them and then is applicable to us and each message is applicable to the church today and each message is applicable to the christian today christ's introduction 
to this compromising church is threatening and frightening. You'll see the way that Christ introduced himself in this church. It says, These things says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. That's not the way he spoke in Ephesus. In Ephesus, he told them, I am he that is holding the stars in my right hand. And I stand in the midst of the golden candlestick. That was comforting. I'll be with you. I'm in your midst. I'm seeing what is happening to you. I will strengthen you. My grace will be sufficient for you. But in the case of this church, he said, I'm coming to you. And I have the sharp sword coming out of my mouth. He spoke because of the judgment that was coming upon them. He wasn't happy or their compromising at all. The sharp two-edged sword from his mouth, that was a stern judgment, word of judgment, about to fall on that compromising church and on the compromisers in that church. Here is a first negative introduction from the one who wields the word of judgment. And it is to every church that tolerates evil or sin or error in their midst. Many churches today are as compromising as the church in Pergamos. And they stand in the danger of imminent judgment. Now, when you think about that city, Pergamos, history tells us that at the time when the book of Revelation was written, Pergamos was the capital of Asia Minor. It was a pagan city. It claimed to have to be a cultural center. And it was famous for its library of 200,000 scrolls because there were rolls of books at that time, not in the printed form in which we have today. Christ said a certain seed of Satan's throne was there. That means that Satan had his permanent residence there. Now, compromise was a great problem, a major problem in the church in Pergamos. We look at this church and we're looking at the danger of compromise in the church. Which church? In the church in Pergamos, yes, but in any other church. The danger of compromise in the church. There are three points we're going to deal with. Number one, the description of Christ and the diagnosis of the church. Number two, defilement and destruction through compromise. Number three, the delight and the destiny of overcoming Christians. I come back to point number one, the description of Christ and the diagnosis of the church. We come to Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading to you there from verse 12. And to the angels of the church in Pergamos write, This thing says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. That's the introduction that Jesus Christ gave himself at this time to this church. Christ's message to this church begins with a presentation of himself as he that has the sharp sword with two edges. And it doesn't leave you to guess what that means. What's he going to do? With those two edges, have you noticed to start with that normally when a soldier holds a sword, in those days, they hold the sword with a hand. But Jesus says, this is a different kind of sword. It is not a sword in my hand. It's a sword that comes out of my mouth. You look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, repent or else. I will come unto thee quickly. I will fight against thee them with the sword of my mouth. When it says the sword of my mouth, that's referring to the word. It's the word of judgment. It's the word of authority coming out of his mouth. And he will fight against the sinners, against the compromisers with that word of judgment that will cut them down like a sword. And it says it has two edges because whichever part of that word, whichever part of that stand judgment that comes to you, one side or the other side, it cuts down. And those two sides are very, very sharp to cut down the compromisers. And you see, to the compromising church, Christ did not present himself as a loving, tender, compassionate Lord, but he presented himself as a firm, frightening judge. And you need to understand that actually all judgment has been committed unto the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a great judge. And he's going to judge his people. And you know that every time he starts talking to any church, any minister there, he says, I know thy works. And he knows all the details. And then he'll begin to describe the details in, in every church. He'll describe the lives of the men and the lives of the women. He'll describe the doctrines they believe and the deeds of their lives and their character and their conduct. He knows everything. And on the basis of that perfect knowledge about what everybody is doing, is a great judge. See Jesus as the judge. Because... 
Many people, they know Jesus only as Savior. Only as the one that is the great healer and the great physician and the one that has great compassion. Yes, when you submit to the Lord, is the great redeemer, the great physician, the great Savior. But when you refuse the Lord and reject the offer of salvation, would you understand that Jesus Christ is a great judge? In John chapter 5, reading verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son. That's why he says, I have the sword of judgment that proceeds out of my mouth. And if those people do not repent, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to cut them down with the sword out of my mouth. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Verses 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God went out. But now he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Because he has ordained a day. In the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he has ordained. Whereof he has given assurance unto all men. In that he has raised him from the dead. You understand then that Jesus Christ is a great judge. The mighty judge. No wonder when Paul the apostle was writing to his own a son in the faith. Timothy said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He says Timothy, Jesus is going to come as a judge. Because of that Timothy, you have something to do, preach the word. In season and out of season. He says reprove and rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Do it as unto the Lord. Do it as before the Lord because when he comes, he's going to examine your work, examine your ministry, examine everything you have done and he is the great judge. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. In verse 12, it says, These things says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. And let's look at chapter 1, verse 16. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it it should smite the nations, and it shall rule them with a rod of iron. And it treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. And you will see then that when he comes, he's going to come as a judge. And he's going to do that in fury. Because he's going to pour out the fierceness of God and the wrath of the Almighty God upon the people. And then we're told in verse 21 of that same chapter, still telling us that when Christ comes, he comes as a judge. Verse 21. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse which sort proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh that means they were killed they were destroyed and then their flesh became uh, food for all those animals we will come back to revelation chapter 2 as we have seen the description of christ and introduced himself describing himself to the church in pagamos now he tells them about their lives in chapter 2 verse 13 I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, and even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. He is talking about their faithfulness. Before Christ pointed out the corrupting influence of the compromising church, that is the church in Pagamos. Christ first revealed areas of faithfulness which was commendable in this church. Well, generally you'll find that uh, the people who might have some flaws in their lives, some blemishes in their lives, many, many times they'll have some good, good points too. It's the mixture of good and evil. And yet eventually the evil may swallow up the thing that is good. But Jesus Christ here was pointing out the faithfulness of this church which was actually commendable. Because the church was in the city where Satan's throne, Satan's seat was. Why did Jesus say it was a place where Satan's seat was? Well, this city was the center of Caesar's worship. 
actually because it was the capital of the Roman Empire. That is of all that area of uh, Asia in particular. They worship Caesar uh, from around the AD 29. History tells us that the people had been trying to exalt Caesar. That's why the compromising Jews. They said, we have no God, we have no king, but Caesar. Uh, they were worshipping him already. And in fact, there was a great, a big altar that was built for a massive idol in Pagamos. It was a center of pagan worship. And that pagan worship spread from that center unto all the Roman Empire. That's why the Lord said, because it's a seat, it's a fountain, it's a place where all the idolatrous worship was spreading throughout the Roman Empire. He said, Satan's seat is there. Satan's throne is there. Satan's headquarters is there. It was a place of peculiar evil and peculiar wickedness where Satan was enthroned. And yet, would you know that even in the midst of the enthronement of the devil there, the church was still there. And the church was holding fast the name of Christ, steadfastly adhering to him and to his cause. They did not deny the faith in Christ. They did not deny the name of the Lord, even though it was in the face of opposition and martyrdom. And the Lord Jesus Christ commended them for their faithfulness. That's what the Lord is expecting today. That if they was in such a difficult situation, in such a difficult place, and yet they could still be faithful, you in your own corner, wherever you are, you can have grace from the Lord and you can be faithful to. We'll be faithful in Jesus' name. In Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Here is a quality of character the Lord is expecting from every minister and from every member of the body of Christ. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be, may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. He wants us to be faithful. Hold that in your hand. Hold that in your mind. Hold that in your heart. The Lord wants us to be faithful in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in us. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Only let your conversation, that's your manner of life, your conduct, your character, only let your lifestyle be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears that you stand fast in one spirit. You stand fast in one spirit. He's talking to the old church there. That is the ministers and the members. The workers and the leaders and everybody. The newcomers and the old timers. That you all stand fast in one spirit. With one mind. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. That there will be no shaky knee or shaky hand or trembling mind. That everyone will stand firm and stand fast on the word of God. Together in unity standing firm whatever may be the opposition whatever may be the persecution standing firm on the watch of god in second peter chapter 3 reading there from verse 17 ye therefore beloved seeing ye know these things before beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness remain steadfast don't fall from that steadfastness whatever wind may blow and whatever storm may rage stand firm and that's why jude was talking to the believers when he said beloved in verse 3 when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was necessary needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints and then jude says i'm telling you this because there are certain men crept in on our ways who were before of old ordained to this condemnation on ungodly men turning the grace of god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god our lord jesus christ it says because opposers will be there persecutors will be there compromisers will be there and he'll try to dissuade you not to be so serious and steadfast with the word of god it says turned firm and let the lord commend your steadfastness and faithfulness as he commended the steadfastness and the faithfulness of the church in pagamos haven't said that we need to understand that everything was not all right 
in the church in Pergamos. We now come to point number two, defilement and destruction through compromise. We come to Revelation chapter 2 and we're reading now from verse 14. Uh, let me ask you a question. If uh, you went to the doctor and the doctor told you after examining you, uh, the doctor looks at you very much and critically and then he, he sits you down and he says, well friend, I need to tell you this. And there are some good, good things about your health and he tells you this is good and this is wonderful. But there are two things I need to tell you, and these two things are devastating. In fact, you have two life threatening diseases. What do you think? All the things he said about all the other good, good things about your health will fade into insignificance because you have two life threatening diseases. It was so with the church in Pergamos. Because all the good things Jesus said about that church, they had some things that were threatening them. The compromise that threatened to snuff out the life of God, the life of Christ in them. Although they were bold and steadfast in the faith, in a sinful, idolatrous, perverted city where Satan had a seat at the throne, this church was not free from the corrupting influence of compromise. Christ, the head of the church, said, I have not just one thing, I have a few things against you. And you see, no matter how we praise ourselves on our good, good points, and no matter what, what others think about us, Christ's evaluation of your Christian life, Christ's evaluation of every detail of your life is exactly what matters. Concerning the church at large, it is Christ's evaluation of the church that matters these compromising church you see they are tolerated some evil things that's why jesus said i have a few things against you look at verse 14 in revelation chapter 2 verse 14 but i have a, a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. you are there in the church they are not controlled they are allowed to have the liberty, whatever liberty they wanted, and they do whatever they want, and they teach whatever they want, and they are corrupting the church, and you leader, pastor, preacher, in that church, in Pergamos, you are not doing anything about it. Yes, I know that you are faithful. I know that you are steadfast. I know that even in that place where Satan's seat is, you are trying to do your best and keep to the doctrine. But look at this. Look at the things I have against you. You have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Not only that, there's another thing I see there. I see that uh, you have there them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans with things I hate. You know, you know here what's happening here? The corruption that happened in the Old Testament. Balaam, in the Old Testament, it was there. The fornication of the olden days, it was there. The ancient habit and the ancient evil of eating things sacrificed to idols, it was there. But then Nicholas, you see Nicholas he was one of the people that were chosen in the early church. And then they, they were ministering to the Lord. And we're told in history that there was a probability that that Nicholas, that he backslid. And he went away from the Lord. And was not teaching a kind of perverted grace. Saying whatever you do, it really doesn't matter. God is a God of grace. He's a God of of love and already you are born again you are saved you once you are saved you are forever saved how could god throw you to hell again after you have been saved nicholas backslid and then he this he now perpetrated this doctrine and some people that were having temptation and they couldn't resist that temptation then they were accepting that doctrine because it was a doctrine that gave them liberty freedom independence you can do whatever you like and you will still get to heaven and that doctrine became recognized as the doctrine of the nicolaitans and Jesus said, it's a doctrine which I hate. That's an error that came in the New Testament. And then you also have the error that came in the Old Testament. And you join the error of the Old and the error of the New. And you join it together. And it is going on like two streams of evil in the church in Pagamos. And pastor, preacher, leader, angel of the church in Pagamos. You are not doing anything about it. I hate that compromise. That you just, I'll do my business. I'll preach the word. I don't care what they're doing. Let them do their own. At least I will do my own. And if I keep on preaching the truth, whatever the disciples of Balaam, whatever they are preaching, and whatever the followers of Nicholas, whatever they are perpetrating, that does not concern me. Oh, yet it concerns you because it says, I have these things against you. Because you see it, and you're not doing anything about it. And then it says in verse 16, it says, repent. 
or else I will come unto you quickly. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And you see that false doctrine had been something that worked like termites, like poison in the church of the living God. You've seen it in the church in Pergamos. Look at Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. That's in the Old Testament. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. That's in the New Testament. Who privately privileged shall bring in damnable heresies. Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And then it says in verse 2, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness. Shall they with faint words make merchandise of you? They want to get rich and they want to have money. And because they want to have money, they will not preach the truth. Because if they preached the truth, they feel they are going to lose the rich members in those assemblies. And so they will be just deceiving them. Telling them, marry whoever you want to marry. And get into the flesh whenever you want to do it. Because God is loving. God is forgiving. The grace of God is abundant. And the grace of God is unlimited. That's what they tell them. And because of that, they deceive them to keep on doing evil. And then the Bible says in verse 3, Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnations lumbereth not. In verse 12 it says, But these as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness that's the judgment of god that's exactly what the lord was telling the church in pagamos there's a sword coming out of my mouth and the word of fierce anger a fierceness and the wrath of god almighty is coming upon those people that are compromising it says that these people are going to be judged by the lord in verse 13 and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in daytime sports they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices caused children it says the curse of god is upon them which are forsaken the right way and have gone astray following the way of balaam the son of bosom who loved the wages of unrighteousness he loved the wages of unrighteousness and there are many people that are doing that just because of the money they are going to get that's all that concerns them just because of the offerings they are going to receive from those people that's what concerns them and they'll delay telling them the truth yes they know the truth they know the real word of god but they will not tell them because if they told them will they bring all the money they have in their bank accounts no they won't tell them because of their covetousness in jude verse 10 but these speak evil of those things which they know not but what they know naturally as brute bees in those things they corrupt themselves it says war unto them for they have gone in the way of Cain and they have run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and they have perished in the gain saying of Cori it says these are spots in your fields of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruits withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And then you see it says in verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own laws, and their mouths speak at great swelling words, uh, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Now, it mentions uh, Balaam. And if you know the story of Balaam, when you get back home, you can read all the story about Balaam yourself. you find the major account of Balaam's life uh, in Numbers chapter 22, chapter 23, chapter 24, a part of chapter 25, and then chapter 31. The point is this, that the children of Israel, they were going from Egypt to the land of promise and Balak of Moab became afraid of them and he said they will lick up the whole land and uh, they had known Balaam to be a prophet and to be a man of authority that
that if he spoke any word, that word will be fulfilled. If he cursed anyone, that fellow was cursed. That family was cursed. That nation, that tribe was cursed. If he blessed anyone, that fellow was blessed. And so Balak sent for Balaam. And he said, can you come and help? Because I have some people here, they occupy the whole land. Please come and help and curse them for me. And uh, before even Balaam could try to seek an answer from the Lord, while he was still waiting upon the Lord that night, the Lord said, don't go. Because those people are blessed. Then he told them, I cannot go. The Lord refuses to allow me to go. And then Balak sent back again. See, this is very urgent. And this could actually make you rich. In fact, whatever you tell me, I'm going to give you. Therefore, please come. Don't say you will not come. Don't let anything hinder you. You must come and curse the people for me. And then he went to the Lord again. And the Lord said, all right, you want to go? You can go. And the Lord gave him his permissive will. It wasn't really the will of God. It wasn't the perfect will of God to go. And then eventually the Lord sent an angel that confronted him. Because his will was perverse before the Lord. And the angel came with a drawn sword. Sword. A sword that came to kill and to destroy Balaam. You remember what Jesus said? He said, repent or else I will come quickly and fight against them. Well, the sword out of my mouth and so then the angel confronted Balaam and eventually Balaam saw the angel and then he fell to the ground and then the angel said your way is perverse before me and then Balaam said if you don't want to go I will go back and then the angel saw that he still wanted to go and eventually said well you can go when he got there, he opened his mouth. All he wanted to do was to curse the people of God. But the Lord changed all the curse and changed it to a blessing. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 5. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God will not hearken unto Balaam. But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee. Because the Lord thy God loved thee. When, the, when Balaam saw that he will not be able to receive his wages of unrighteousness. He will not be able to get the money that he was, uh, he was expecting from Balak. Then he said, well, if I cannot curse the people, I will corrupt the people. If I cannot curse the people, I will corrupt the people. And then he counseled Balak. He said, you know what you are going to do? And you will pay me my money because if you do this, you are going to defeat them. And when you defeat them, whether I do it by curse or I do it by corruption, all you want is that the people should be destroyed. And so he said, introduce your women to them. Release your women to them. And as soon as those Israelites begin to commit immorality with them, the Lord is going to be angry with them. He's going to destroy them. And that corruption actually worked at that time. I want you to look at uh, Numbers chapter 25 because 24,000 of them eventually died because of the plague that the Lord sent to them as a result of that going into the women of Moab. In Numbers chapter 25 verse 9, and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4 thousand twenty four thousand well what happened to this false prophet what happened to the corrupting uh, prophet that influenced Balak to corrupt the children of israel well he died by the sword look at this in numbers chapter 31 verse 8 and he slew the kings of midian beside the rest of them that were slain namely evi and rakim and zo and or and reba five kings of midian then it says Balaam also, Balaam also, the son of Boam, they slew with the sword. He escaped the sword of the angel, but because he continued in his evil, he didn't escape the sword eventually. Balaam was a prophet for hire. He tried to curse Israel, but he failed. So he planned to corrupt them. And his counsel caused the women of Moab to seduce the Israelites, leading the Israelites to fornication and to idolatry. The doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans actually taught and encouraged freedom and liberty to sin. While well, still professing to remain believers in the Lord. And what happened to Balaam will happen to the people that are corrupted today and they refuse to repent. I've told you already that although Balaam temporarily escaped the sword in Numbers chapter 22, eventually he was slain with the sword of those children of Israel when eventually uh, they came into war. So shall it be. 
with the unrepentant backsliders and false teachers and compromisers who pervert the grace of God, teaching and influencing other believers to be at liberty to yield to the flesh and to yield to sin. That's the reason we ought to be very careful and we ought to take warning that we shouldn't allow what the people of the world say, what backsliders say, what compromisers say to lead us into evil and into sin. In Romans chapter 14 verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this, rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Because if you do that, you'll be like Balaam, making another, another individual to fall from his own steadfastness. Or oh, now to point number three, the delight and the destiny of overcoming Christians. In Revelation chapter 2, Reading from verse 16 and verse 17, it says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Here is the Lord talking. It says, You don't have much time if you are, if you are backsliding. You don't have much time if you have compromised. You don't have much time if you have been yielding to the works of the flesh. You don't have much time that remains for you to repent if you have been bending the knee before the idol of immorality, fornication, and things like that. Judgment is coming. And the sword is about to fall upon you. Repent or else I will come quickly. I will come quickly. I'm not going to tolerate sin forever. I'm not going to tolerate your compromise forever. I'm not going to tolerate all those works of the flesh and your bad influence on other people. I'm not going to tol tolerate that for a long time. I'm not going to allow that uh, worm or that, uh, that terrible thing that is spreading contagious evil that is spreading in the midst of the people of God. I'm not going to tolerate that forever. Repent or else I will come to you very quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The Lord is calling everyone to repentance. He's saying that there must be repentance. In fact, that's what he's always telling the people. If there has been any evil, any compromise, any backsliding, he says repent. Look at that same chapter, verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. What a pity. The Lord said, I've been patient, and I gave this other one at a time or space, chance to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And there are not many people like that here today. They have done evil. And because judgment has not fallen the moment or the minute or the day that they committed the sin, they continue committing the sin. And the Lord is saying, huh, the time will not be forever. I will come quickly. I will not tolerate sin in any backslider forever and ever. I'm coming. And it says, behold, in verse 22, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. What the Lord is asking for is change of heart, change of life, change of mind, and change of direction. There must be repentance to reject the evil, and you come to what is good. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. I'm, I'm correcting you, chast chastising you, rebuking you, not because I hate you, but because I want you to escape from the sword coming out of my mouth. I don't want you to bear the heavy, fiery judgment of God. That's why I'm warning you, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, and he says, I'm sorry, I bow, I bend, I repent, I turn. If any man will open the door and say, I welcome you in now, cleanse me, forgive me, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, will I grind to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm set down with my father in his throne. It's asking us that he wants repentance in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, reading from verses 30 and 31. It says, At the times of this ignorance, God winked at. I didn't know. All right, now you know. The times of ignorance, God winked at. I didn't know that, uh, you know, just touching like that by just touching that uh, lady and, you know, doing this and do I didn't know it would lead into real immorality. Now you know. 
You've seen it now. But the times of ignorance God winged that, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I didn't know that I will, you know, fall like that and then be rolling in the mud in the mire. I didn't know it will come to, to that. Now it has come to that, and you know, and you know the debt in which you have gone into, and you know the corruption and the evil and the compromise and the bad influence you have on other people now. Now that you know the Lord is saying there's still remedy. If you will repent, now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because if you don't repent, verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead is that same repentance is still emphasizing in chapter 3 acts chapter 3 verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord and then he says and he shall send jesus christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. In verse 26, unto you. First, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. That's why the Lord is speaking to us today. He wants to turn us away from all our iniquity. And as he turns us away from all our iniquity, he wants us to yield to him. He wants us to surrender to him so that iniquity will not be our ruin. And as the Lord is saying, repent quickly, repent quickly because you don't have much time left. This is the time that you ought to repent and give yourself unto the Lord. What if you repent? And then if you become steadfast unto the very end after that repentance, what promise has he given you? And what destiny is he pronouncing and preparing for the people that repent and they come out of the deeds of the Nicolaitans and they come out of the doctrines of Balaam and they come out of the immorality and out of eating things sacrificed unto idols and they come out of all their sins so as to give themselves to be committed totally unto the Lord. Look at it in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 2. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, I will give to each of the hidden manner. When it says to him that overcometh, what does that mean? Well, number one, it means to him who remains a conqueror. The one that maintains victory. It's a victory of a moral character. You know what was happening in the church in Pagamos? What was happening is that uh, compromise was just spreading. Corruption was spreading. When the corruption gets to your gate and stops there, you are an overcomer. You overcome that corruption. You do not permit that corruption to enter into your life, into your language, into your profession. All the doctrines of Balaam, all the counseling of Balaam, why, why don't you do it? Well, why don't you mix among the women of the world and the women of a Moab. Why don't you give yourself to it when you overcome that? That's the overcomer. Because that's exactly the evil thing in Pagamos that they needed to overcome. And when the doctrine of the Nucleatans come to you, that is the doctrine of backsliding Nicholas. When it comes to you, who is Nicholas? Nicholas is somebody that has been one of us before. One of our workers before. One of our leaders before. And that Nicholas now is going away from the faith. It's going away from the people of God and then it's coming from outside it's coming from outside to trouble the people that are inside and he's saying there's too much strictness here you're too strict here in deeper life I was there before, don't you know my name I am Nicholas and they even chose me as one of the effective people and one of the effective preachers here but now since I went out I've discovered liberty I've discovered independence and I'm doing all those things. I don't have any guilt in my heart. And in fact, the Lord is still working with me. Who is an overcomer? The overcomer is the one that overcomes all those suggestions of Nicholas and all the cassettes of Nicholas and all the literature of Nicholas that you are reading secretly so that you can be enjoying the liberty to sin and still be pretending that you are a Christian. All those cassettes and all the literature of backsliding Nicholas, you will throw away. That's the overcomer. That's why Jesus said, he that overcomes. That's the person that triumphs over his own 
easily be certain sin. The easily be certain sin that came into your life after Nicholas, the Nicolaitans, uh, came to trouble you and they came to pump their error into you. You overcome those sins now and you have the victory over the world and over the temptations in the world and you triumph over every prevailing evil and error around you and then you remain free from the corrupting influence of compromise. Those are the overcomers. And when you overcome like that, what's the Lord saying? The Lord is saying, look at it in verse 17 there, chapter 2, verse 17. It says to him that overcometh, will I give to it of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. It says, I'm going to give him of the hidden manna. Why hidden? Because it's not going to be made available to everybody. It's going to be available only to the people that know the Lord and love the Lord. It's going to be available only to the people that are the children of God. When it says uh, it's going to give them hidden manna, it's referring to the children of Israel. Uh, when they were passing through the wilderness, going to the land of Canaan. He said, do you know that no Egyptian ate part of that manna? Do you know none of the people that remain in Egypt, none of them ate of that manna? And if anybody went back to Egypt, they will miss eating the manna. It's telling us that it's only those who are born again that will have this reward that is given. And they're going to eat with the angels. It tells us in Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 24 and verse 25. And I drench down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels food. He sent them meat to the full. He's saying that uh, you'll be eventually with the angels of God in heaven and you will eat angels food. You will eat the bread and the corn of heaven and you will sup with him and you will fellowship with him. But that is only for the uh, people that overcome on the final day. I pray you'll be an overcomer in Jesus name. And then he says in that verse 17, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, more things that he will give and I will give him a white stone and in that stone a new name reaching. What does that mean? A white stone. In those days when people went to court, somebody had been accused that he did wrong and then eventually the judge looked at him and they examined the case and the advocate and the lawyer argued everything and brought out all the documents and said no this man is not guilty. Then that person will be discharged and acquitted. And then to show that no policeman that can, uh, can catch him anymore or can arrest him anymore is giving a white stone. You are justified. He's talking about the believer. That the devil will be accusing you, saying that you will not go to heaven. You will perish. You will go to hell. And then you say, but I have the grace of God. By the grace of God, I've overcome. And I'm running away from the error of Balaam and the error of the Nicolaitans. And the Lord is bearing witness in my heart. I'm a child of God. And then you appear before the Lord. And Jesus Jesus Christ, our advocate, he appears for you. And then he says, yes, I know his works. I know his heart. I know his life. I know his ministry. I know everything he has done. Although Satan is bringing accusation against him, he is free. And then you are given a white stone. You are free and you are free forevermore. And he says a new name will be written there. The name of the Lord himself. And only the person that receives that uh, stone of acquittal will know the name that is written there, which no man knoweth except saving him that receives receives that stone, a precious gift, a reward that will be for all eternity, the glory of God in heaven. As you think about what the Lord has promised, and you're asking yourself, will you be there? Will you be there in heaven at last? When they compromise us, when they are going to hell. When the sinners, when they are going to hell. When the backsliders, when they are banished in hell. And they'll be in hell forever and ever. Where will you be on that final day? Wonderful thing, the Lord is telling us that if you become an overcomer, but as it is written, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I'm making up my mind, I'm going to receive that thing. And I'm going to be there. When the saints go marching in, if you don't find anybody there, you'll find me. I make up my mind, I'll be steadfast to the end. All the error of Balaam, all the error of the Nicolaitans, I will not be involved in it. I'm going to make it. Will you make it? I said, will you make it? Will you be an overcomer? And then on that day, when all things are over, you'll be able to sing the song of redemption, saying, praise the Lord. We're home at last. I pray you'll be home at last with the great reward of God in your heart, in your life for all eternity. Rise up and pray and tell the Lord you want to be an overcomer. Let